As we discussed in episode 3, Mesopotamia is known to history as the cradle of civilization. Before Mesopotamia was excavated, scholars believed that Greece was the cradle of civilization. However, Sumeria predates Greece by 1,000 years. This is a perfect example of how the historical record can change after an important discovery. Older history books will tell about Greece as the oldest and first civilization, while modern books tell of Sumeria. There is a wild variety of wheat that still grows in eastern Turkey. It is now believed that it was this wheat that lured the hunter-gatherers to first make permanent settlements. While Europe was still in the Stone Age, the earliest people learned how to store the wheat they gathered for weeks or months. Large amounts of wheat could not be transported easily. This prompted them to stay and protect the wheat supplies. These early farmers then began to farm the wheat. Their main preoccupation became to gain higher yields of wheat by manipulating the environment. They dug irrigation canals with reservoirs and dams, and they then developed water wheels. They began to plant seeds using a funnel and to plant other crops such as millet and barley. They eventually migrated into lower Mesopotamia where there is flatter land filled with river silt. They made larger canals and larger areas of crops. Small villages formed along the two rivers where fishing was also developing as an industry. The fishermen worked with the farmers. People began to create an economy supporting one another. Mesopotamia does not have a wide variety of resources. Mainly, all they have is fishing, farming, and weaving of reeds. They relied heavily on trade from other areas for brass, copper, wood, stone, or other resources. Mesopotamia became a trading center because people were settling there. Traders would bring goods because they knew there were people gathered there who needed them. The villages became marketplaces and the rivers became shipping routes because they could move larger amounts of goods by boat around the region. Eventually the larger villages became towns and cities. The four main Sumerian cities were Nippur, Uruk, Girsu, and Ur. The largest city was the port city of Ur. These cities were not square, they were very unplanned. No house lined up with the others. The city was, was more winding, rounded curves than straight lines. There were no sewers and people burned their garbage outside the house in the winding narrow streets. The houses had low doors and the mud brick rooms had vent holes to keep cool in the hot daytime and they slept on the flat roof in the cool of the night. These four cities diverted the river through canals to irrigate farmland. The tar from the local tar pits was used to seal boat hulls and mud brick buildings. Among the writings they found over 300 different recipes for beer. They would sit around a large clay pot of beer, each person having a long straw to draw from. They made fine artwork using the mother of pearl, soldered gold, and chiseled stone inlaid with precious stones and seashells. Sumeria is the oldest civilization known to have wheels, writing, a central law, farming, mathematics, astrology, and many other sciences. They developed a system of laws and trade contracts. Each person carried a personalized cylinder seal, which when rolled in wet clay would make a picture. This was used as a signature for contracts. At the latter part of the Sumerian civilization, the ziggurat came into use. A ziggurat is a pyramid-shaped building with stairways up the side and a flat platform on top where the temple to the local deity would be located and the rituals would be performed on behalf of the people by the high priest. There were many ceremonies and rituals performed in the temple. 
One clay tablet records one such ritual. The offerings included 250 loaves of bread, 50 sheep, 8 lambs, 2 ox, and 1 calf offered to the gods and fed to 1,200 priests and workers of the temple. Older ziggurats are smaller, while the later ones, such as the one which still stands at Ur, built around 2100 BC, is over 100 feet high. The city of Ur surrounded the ziggurat and is estimated to house approximately 34,000 people. Sumeria was a collection of city-states. There was no central government. Each city had its own ruler and its own deity which represented that city. They believed the earth was like a bubble floating in salt water. The land was a flat disk with mountains all around the edge and surrounded by fresh water within the bubble. The dome above the land was sky and the dome below the land was the netherworld. This concept bears resemblance to the creation story of Genesis. Chapter 1, verse 6 to 8. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. The Sumerians were polytheistic, with four principal gods, or Anunnaki, Anu, or An, the sky god, Enki, the sea god, Enlil, the air god, and Ki, the mother earth. Aside these four, there were three astral deities, Nana, the moon goddess of heaven and earth, Nana's son, the sun god, Utu, who shed the light of justice upon the world, and Nana's daughter, Inanna, the goddess of lust and war. These principal gods were known to the Sumerians as the Seven, and were the most important for guiding the affairs of the people. From time to time, the idol of the god of the city would be paraded through the city and then back to the temple. This is practiced still today in some countries. The Arabian Bedouin tribes formed a trade connection with the Sumerians early on. They shared certain deities. Nana, the Sumerian moon goddess, was known as Sin to the Arabians, while Nana's daughter, Inanna, the goddess of lust and war, was known to the Arabians as Ishtar. The gods were in charge of the forces of nature whom man must serve. If a person wished to accomplish a specific task or goal, they would appease the appropriate god for that task. The chief of each city would appease the deity of that city for the safety and prosperity of the city. There were higher prices on the higher gods, while a poor family might be able to offer something of value to a lesser god and be heard. The lesser god may even be able to approach one of the seven on the person's behalf. Death was simply a mystery of the netherworld, and kings would be accompanied in death by mass suicide of their servants, who were buried with them. The Sumerians used a form of writing called cuneiform. It was first thought to be merely pictures and not writing at all, but soon it was deciphered as an actual language, much like the hieroglyphics of Egypt. Most of what we know of the Sumerians is from what was written about them by the people who replaced them. The later empires of Mesopotamia, called Assyria and Babylon, also copied the legends and culture of the Sumerians, adding it to their own. Many cuneiform tablets were found in the Assyrian digs, copied in cuneiform and translated into the Akkadian language of later times. There is now a huge abundance of information written down for us from the Sumerians and the Assyrians and Babylonians because they adapted much of the Sumerian culture. 
This actually led to the founding of two entirely new branches of archaeology, biblical archaeology and Assyriology, the study of Assyrian archaeology. We know that Sumeria was a collection of city-states, each city having their own king. There were some lists of kings available from some of these cities, but we don't need to go into that much detail. Instead, we only need to understand how Sumeria came to a close. Sumeria was not always a peaceful, serene place. Often, there were brutal wars between the city-states for various reasons. By the close of the Sumerian dynasty, a city called Lagash had gained prominence in the region. Its last king, Uru Kagina, had published a law code. This is the earliest known example of government reform. The elite class of priests and property owners who were taking too much from the lower class were reined in by this new set of laws. The widow and the orphan were no longer at the mercy of the rich and the powerful according to this new law code. It set limits upon the elite as to how much power they had over the poorer class. The last king of Uruk, another Sumerian city-state, had a different plan. Lugal Zagaski, king of Uruk, invaded Lagash. He destroyed the temples of the city and massacred the people. Lugal de Zagaski went on a raiding campaign throughout Samaria, destroying several cities. Some say this was the first kingdom, which lasted for 25 years. But others say it was no more than a raiding party who never actually ruled over these cities. There is not enough information available to determine which is true. But one thing all can agree upon. These raids left Sumeria in a state of weakness, bringing Sumeria to an end by the next dynasty, the Akkadian. The Amaru were the largest of the Canaanite tribes. In later times, all Canaanites became known as Amaru. Canaan is the land known today as Israel and southwest Syria. In the Bible, they are called Amorites but in the cuneiform documents, they are called Amaru. The principal city of the Amaru was Aleppo, which is still named that today. Aleppo was strategically located on the trade route between Canaan, the Mediterranean Sea, and the northern crossing of the Euphrates River, leading to Mesopotamia and the north. Trade routes were extremely important regarding the rise and fall of kingdoms. We will discuss trade routes in greater detail in a later episode. By the end of the Sumerian dynasty, the Amaru had been trading with Sumeria for quite a long time, supplying them with vital resources such as wood, copper, tin, and items from Egypt and other parts of the Mediterranean Sea. The Amaru had settled and dominated the upper Euphrates River as well as cohabiting with the Sumerians. When Lugel Zagaski raided and destroyed the cities of Samaria, he attacked the Sumerian city of Kish with his usual brutality, killing the king of Kish. An Amaru boy, known as Sargon, was born to a temple prostitute in the city of Kish. His mother abandoned him in a basket in the rushes along the Tigris River, where he was found by one of the king's shepherds, who raised him as his own son. Sargon eventually became the cupbearer to the king of Kish, Urzababa. When Urzababa was killed in the raid by Lugal Zagaski, king of Uruk, Sargon secured the kingship of his master and vowed to revenge his death. While Lugo Zagaski was away on raids, leaving his city vulnerable, Sargon attacked Uruk, inflicting brutal revenge upon them equal to what Kish had suffered. When Lugo Zagaski heard of the attack, he returned to defend his city, but was captured by Sargon and brought in a neck stock to the gates of Nippur, one of the prominent cities of Sumeria, where he was publicly executed. 
Sargon then continued his campaign across the southern Mesopotamia, conquering the most important city-states of the Sumerians. He then adapted the gods and culture of the Sumerians, making his own daughter the priestess of Nana, the moon god of Ur, and himself the priest of Anu, the sky god and chief god of the Anunnaki. Sargon built his capital city, Agade, on the Euphrates River. From this we get the word Akkadian. Agade is yet to be located by archaeologists. He then led a campaign against Susa, the principal marketplace of the Elamites, to the east, turning it into a military stronghold for his kingdom. After this, he returned westward into the northern Mesopotamia. He was able to bring raw lumber from the cedars of Lebanon on the Mediterranean coast, floating them down the Euphrates River to his new capital at Agade. This is quite a feat in those times, or even a hundred years ago, bringing lumber over 500 miles down the river. This is an early sign of industrial activity. The results of working together and achieving greater goals for the group importing on an industrial level. Sargon organized a military to protect the workers who would cut the cedars down and prepare them to be floated down the river. He also protected the route as they journeyed back with the wood to build the cities. Lebanon is a mountain range on the northeastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Lebanon was once a great cedar forest. Today there are protected areas in Lebanon to protect the trees left standing, which are very few compared to the great cedars which once covered a large area surrounding Lebanon. Cedar is a softwood which is very easily split into planks and used to build boats, house beams, boxes, utensils, bowls, and just about anything. These shipments of wood greatly raised the living standards of the people of Mesopotamia. Sargon the Great is credited with forming the first kingdom ruling over several cities, the first national military, the first industrial project. Sargon the Great, 2334 to 2278 BC, the first Akkadian king, was the greatest military and administrative genius of his time. He is still revered as a military genius by military scholars today. Because the Amaru settled the upper Euphrates, Sargon managed to add several Amaru cities to his kingdom also. Before him, the entire area of Sumer was Sumerian, but beginning with the rise of Sargon, the Akkadian language, the language of the Amaru, gradually replaced the Sumerian cuneiform language. As the history of the Sumerians progressed, different gods of the seven had taken on different roles, and new stories developed. The later Akkadians adapted the Sumerian beliefs and added to them according to their beliefs. The Akkadians had a hero named Gilgamesh. There are several stories about Gilgamesh, who was two-thirds god and one-third man. Now this also brings us back to Enoch and the Nephilim. Well, anyway, he was a type of Mesopotamian Hercules, or Superman, who had close dealings with the gods and helped mankind by slaying evil dragons and changing the order of things for man's benefit. There is a flood story of Gilgamesh which is almost exactly the same as the flood story of Noah, except of course Gilgamesh is the hero who builds the boat and not Noah. Basically the Sumerian and Akkadian religious beliefs are very similar with amazing similarities to the Genesis account with a wide variety of mythical legends involving the seven and other players such as Gilgamesh. We will cover this in detail in a later episode. Upon his death, Sargon the Great had built a kingdom covering the entire region of Sumeria, adding to it Susa and the surrounding region and the upper Euphrates region. 
The Akkadian language dominated the region from that time forward. After Sargon died, the vassal cities rebelled against his son and successor, Remush, who spent his ten-year reign bringing the city-states back under subjection, using tens of thousands of troops. He was killed in a palace coup and replaced by Manish Tuzu, his elder brother. Manish Tuzu, who ruled for 15 years, conquered the cities of Oman. This area is known for its copper mines, bringing another valued resource into the Akkadian kingdom. After Manish Tuzu died, Naram Sin took the throne of Agade. Naram Sin brought the Akkadian dynasty to its greatest heights. First, he had to deal with a revolt among a coalition of Sumerian kings in Sumer. He then moved north and subjugated a people known as Lullaby, who lived on the Zagaros Mountains in what is now Armenia. After this, he again brought Elam and Susa under his rule, who had also revolted. He also stretched his rule in the upper Euphrates all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. Naram Sin took upon himself the title God of Akkad and King of the Four Directions. His kingdom did, after all, stretch north, south, east, and west of Agad. Naram Sin fell in battle to the Gudians, a marauding tribe from the Zaragoza Mountains. His kingdom declined rapidly and never recovered from this blow. After the death of Naram Sin, all of the vassal states revolted, and his son and predecessor, Shar Kali Shari, could not recover these losses. After 150 years, the great empire of Sargon became decentralized and collapsed. But the world would never be the same. Every king of every city-state now had to build a military defense and many of them now had aspirations to be a great king of a great kingdom over all the other cities. Military alliances were now an important part of any king's leadership, and other people's resources were fair game if you have the strength to take it. The Akkadian kingdom represents the first great kingdom of men, and the main reason for its collapse is recorded in history. The people were ruled over, but not willingly. With every successive king, they revolted. For the next 50 years, the city-states were decentralized, each one ruling itself more or less, until 2141, a foreign conqueror known as Gouda had some kind of agreement with the city of Lagash and helped conquer its neighbors of Ur, Uma, and Uruk. This domination of Gouda lasted for 20 years over the region, which was now a mixture of Sumerians and Akkadians. We have now covered the main history of Mesopotamia up until about 2200 BC. In our next episode, we will briefly pause on Mesopotamia and bring ourselves up to speed with what was happening in the rest of the Middle East during this same time period. We'll see you in the next episode. Now don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell if you want to receive notifications.